Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. Coming up, we'll take a look at Knife News Best Slip Joint of the Year, uh, as the voters of the readers of Knife News have determined. Uh, in the state of the collection, we're going to take a look at some oldies but goodies, two big knives that aren't cold steel <coughs> folders, and then the best USA-made knife companies. Now, I was going through my uh, knife uh, cabinet. What is it? It is a tool chest. So I was going through my my knife chest and really looking at kind of the things I might want to sell off and just the things that I value the most out of the collection. I kept coming to knives that were made in America and, and a lot of knives that were designed by Americans and made elsewhere. Uh, I also love their excellent knives and, and knives I prize in my collection, primarily because I've spoken to a lot of the people behind them. And that means something to me. But these knives I'm going to list today, Made in America, there is something about them that uh, it goes beyond any sort of sense of national pride, uh, which I do have. Um, but this is something else. These are amazing and sublime in their own ways. So we're going to list those off and we'll uh, show examples from each company. There's a, a lucky 13 of them here. Um, Could have gone for one more, but honestly... I like the knife and it's going to be in the pocket check, but I don't like the company. So we'll talk about that. All right. So, uh, well, we'll talk about that right now. Let's get to the pocket check. All right. Here we are at the beginning of the show. My first chance to show off what I'm carrying uh, because no one else around me cares. I got to show you guys. Uh, so today I'm carrying uh, the Strider Knives SMF. And this is the company I was alluding to. Uh, not that I don't like the company, but I just don't. I've never been that close with them, <laughs> if you know what I mean. This is only my second, or this is only my third Strider ever, and um, I don't know. I, they leave me a little cold. Let me say it that way. Uh, I know that they had a breakup and a and a and a uh, sort of restructuring, but even before that. <clears throat> Uh, uh, anyway, I, I, it's just a personal thing, a personal preference. Uh, but I love their knives, uh, especially this SMF, the large one. Now, this one I got from uh, uh, Terrell Todd, Zelric42. Uh, he sold this to me uh, at a fair price. Uh, it did come with the requisite lock stick that uh, many, many uh, striders come with. Uh, I had the Lego SMF, that thing. Uh, I ended up getting rid of it because I, I desired another knife more. But what was easier, uh, what made it easier to get rid of was this lock stick that just required constant pencil on the tang you know uh, you know the trick uh, if you've got lock lock stick you can take pencil a graphite or sharpie the sharpie never works as well for me plus it you're going to risk marking up the knife but uh you can put pencil on the tang there uh at the blade uh at the um lock interface there and uh you'll get you'll get uh, an absence of lock stick. It will remedy the lock stick, but it's a temporary fix and it's just a mask for a defect in the design. Uh, in any case, it's still a classic knife. I still love it. I still think it's uh, much better in this concealed carry contoured grip than it is in the Lego. Lego's just too damn big uh, in the SMF. So uh, happy to have this in my collection. It's got a beautiful um, mirror edge and uh, a beautifully shaped blade. I wouldn't mind getting others with the, I wouldn't mind getting the Tanto or the swedged version. They're just so expensive, you know, on the secondary market. And, and for, and I say that because that's where I would find the desirable striders, at least desirable to my taste would be in the secondary market. And, you know, you're never going to find a strider under like 600 bucks, 650 bucks. I just feel like they're very expensive right now. So um, this one, will hold me until until when until i have the overwhelming desire for another strider okay i got i gotta i got to uh <laughs> i got to acknowledge something i'm a little herky jerky today uh i did drink a tad bit too much wine last night uh but it was for a good occasion so we'll put it that way uh, we we laid my uh father-in-law to rest finally uh this this past uh, well yesterday and uh there were some festivities afterward and uh, it has affected my speaking. So the next knife today uh, that I'm carrying is the Stroop Knives TU2. 
uh, Chris Stroop was on the podcast a couple of weeks back and uh, we talked all about his process and his inspirations. He's a former combat vet uh, of the army uh, from the army. And he came back to the States and started this awesome knife company. Uh, they ca came on my radar from blade magazine. I was waiting for a, pres a, subs a prescription at CVS and yeah, they had a blade magazine and I picked it up and I saw, I saw, uh, was this knife or the mini, which looks like this. And I was like, Oh, that's a cool sax looking knife. I want that. And then that one thing led to another. I got in touch with him. He came on the show and then I ended up buying, well, my wife ended up buying this for me for Christmas and, uh, had, had the knife junkie logo etched in there, right there. It's kind of hard to see, but, um, I love this sort of rustic, rugged, uh, treatment of the flats of the steel and the, just the, the steel in general. Uh, it's, it reminds me a little bit of, uh, black rock knives or why i i dig those black rock knives similar sort of uh vibe to them um something ancient and modern about them at the same time uh i just this week was carrying this in the waistband i finally got uh, this uh concealed carry concepts clip on it and uh or discrete carry i always mess that up discrete carry concepts uh clip on it and it carries very well i was concerned that the length of the handle and the fact that the handle has this upward and uh, protrusion would like jam into my ribs. But with it riding edge forward, that means this horn is faced forward. It just, it fits perfectly. It fits very well uh, in the waistband and against my ribs and against my manly love handles. Uh, and, and I was concerned that it wouldn't. So I'm really happy to have this as an EDC fixed blade because it's, it's on the large side for what I can carry. It's probably the largest EDC fixed blade uh, I carry regularly now. So uh, great knife. It, it's also I couldn't resist. Uh, I couldn't resist the maroon and black uh, contour G10. Yep, I know. I'm getting I'm getting a little dorky with the maroon handled knives, but I just they're I love them. I love maroon. I love burgundy. Let's call it burgundy in, uh, in a thematic deference to the, the hangover I have. Uh, I really do love burgundy colored anything, but on a knife, especially with a black blade, mm, beautiful. All right. So that's what I was carrying today. Let me know what you were carrying today. And you can do that by leaving a comment below. Uh, all it has to say is uh, I was carrying the uh, Chris Reeve knives Sabenza, or I was carrying my, um, you know, Spider Co. whatever. Just leave a comment there or call the listener line 724-466-4487 and uh, say those words and we'll and we'll take them and we'll one of these days we're going to put together a montage of uh yeah, I need uh, I need a hair appointment on Thursday and hey, I need my brakes checked. That's what I get. That's what I get. So so leave me a good message on the phone. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh okay, so uh another way you can support us besides just commenting and liking and hitting the subscribe button and hitting the bell for notifications is going to Patreon. <clears throat> because if you support us at Patreon, you get a sticker with this really super cool logo that my sister designed. And uh, you also get uh, a lot of free extra content like um, like interview extras. Every interview we do, we do some extra uh, content, uh, extra minutes of interview with that person and post that for patrons. And then uh, also uh, you get entered in a monthly knife giveaway if you are, are in the Gentleman Junkie strata. So come support us. Uh, we would really appreciate it. And it keeps the thing going and it keeps new knives coming through here that I can show you. So the quickest way to do that is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. I'm going to repeat that because it's a long address. It's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast, and now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life news. A lot of the, a lot of knife in that bumper. I like it. Good old friend Terry. All right, so uh, I want to talk about one thing today in Knife Life news, and uh, you know I'm a close follower of Knife News. I love that uh, website, and I love uh, Ben Schwartz's writing. He's the he's the editor and head writer over there. I think the writer over there, and he's awesome. He uh, can write article after article after article about wee knives that are basically identical and make each one seem new and exciting. And I really respect that. Um, but every year he does, 
they team up over there at Knife News with uh, with work sharp sharpeners and do a survey, you know, of the readers. It's uh, the readers poll and they go through categories. Best this, best that. Uh, I was very interested in what came up as the best slip joint slash non locking folder. And it's a knife that I I slept on and missed. I didn't miss my opportunity. I could I could. I could get it now, but um, I'm not in that slip joint collecting phase where I want to spend that money on that knife. Okay, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the uh, uh, tactile knife company Bear. Uh, it looks like Bexar, but it's the Bear. And and Jim is bringing up this. I just want to show off that I I have a tactile turn and I love it. I mean, a tactile knife. I really do love this knife and. I, I love it more and more every time I carry it. It's it's sort of gone over its smoothness plateau, you know? It plateaued uh, being very, very smooth, and now it's just, it's into the stratosphere, very smooth knife. Anyway, I love it, and they are known for their, um, you know, it started by, it, the company was started by Will Hodges, a guy who, who started Tactile Turn, uh, an, an EDC stalwart company that's been making you know small pens for edc for a long time beautifully um milled and beautifully turned on lathes and such and then they they took their turn into knife making last year with last year not even like uh at the beginning of last year but like march they started pumping these out uh, this is the famous rock wall and they just nailed it right out of the gate well the bear is their slip joint uh, version of this knife or just their slip joint knife uh, and it is beautiful and when I, I put myself on the list to be allowed or avail, uh, able to buy it when it came out and they sent me the email and I was like I don't have 200 bucks to spend on a slip joint right now so I passed on it and now everyone's talking about how great it is and I feel like I'm left out in the cold uh, I'll, I'll get my hands on one eventually but it is uh, man okay so if you would bring up the picture that the clip point blade i think is stunning now there have been clip point blades on slip joints for time immemorial but they somehow i don't know they got they got it just right it's got it in in that it looks like a classic clip joint uh clip point blade but they have put something on it. They've put a spin on it, and I can't tell what it is. Maybe it's in the swedge. That just makes it look unique and different. And then I think that it's accentuated by those double nail necks. I think that's so cool. So this is a knife, obviously, a two-handed knife. So let's be different about how we open it. You know, So they, they added these two nicely milled um, uh, nail necks on both sides of the blade, I think. And then each one comes with a bead, uh, a, uh, a bead that they have uh, turned on one of their Swiss lathes. Uh, so beautiful. The whole package, you know, and it comes with that little cord and the little fob. I think it's beautiful. And now I have to get it because we're talking about it here and uh, I'm looking at it and it would fit so nicely in my little uh, leather slip. One of my little leather slips that, uh, I don't know. Okay, so all I do know is that if it's anything like the rock wall, which I'm sure it is, it's it's a fantastic knife. And the readers of Knife News are savvy. You know, people who actually regularly go to something called Knife News probably care about knives and know about them a bit. So, uh, ooh, I just uh, I just cut my thumb a little bit there. Uh, so I know it's going to be a great knife. Can't wait to check it out. Um, so go over to Knife News, check them out, go somewhat regularly. Every day they have at, at least one new article on a new knife. And uh, that's a pretty good drip, 365 articles in a year on a new knife. That's pretty good. Uh, or a new knife a product or some something happening in the knife world. Uh, check them out and also check out all the other uh, reader polls uh, 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 results. I think Benchmade got the best kitchen knife this year. Pretty cool looking knife, gotta say. All right, still to come on the Knife Junkie podcast, uh, a vitamin drip straight into my veins, and then some uh, oldies but goodies. We're gonna take it a look uh, look at a couple of large folders uh, that are not cold steel, that are awesome. Um, and then we're gonna take a look at the best USA made knife companies, and I will show examples right here coming up on the Knife Junkie podcast. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. Let's. 
Okay, here we go. First one in this oldies but goodies uh, state of the collection. Now, oldies but goodies, I bring them up when I haven't gotten anything new that week because it's a good time to reflect and uh, pay gratitude and or show gratitude for the things I actually have. It's not all about acquiring. It's also about appreciating. Okay, so uh, this is a large knife and a beautiful classy knife from a beautiful and classy man. Yes, I can say that. This comes from Bastien Coves and Bastinelli Creations. Uh, this is the Big Drago Tack. I always liked that he called it big instead of large. It is indeed a big knife. Uh, if you look at it, as I flip it over, it it is a titanium frame lock, giant titanium frame lock folder. The biggest, biggest I have. Uh, I am going to, I'm always bad when I put it down against this background and try and measure things. I always mess it up. So I'm going to, I'm going to try a ruler here today. So it's got a handle of six inches and a blade of, what is this? Four, four and a half, four and three quarters, depending on where you measure from. And uh, it's a big old sax. Look at this thing. It's a, it's a worn cliffy. It's a bellied worn cliff. That's what I like to call it sometimes or a sax. And it's got all of these great handholds. So like, like the Voyager, or any of the large cold steel knives, there are options. You have a lot of room and you have some choils here and the choils uh, give you the options. So you can come all the way up here and have your thumb way up on this awesome jimping right north of the, uh, or I guess that's west of the thumb plate. And uh, you can have your thumb back here in this position. That's a, just a regular saber position. So Filipino grip, saber grip, hammer grip works nicely too because the fat of your thumb here fits in this little nook. Or you can come all the way back here for reach. You know, I get, I, I wouldn't come any further back, but it, it gives you options, this big, beautiful knife. And then the curve of that handle also uh, presents the point in in your know, center line without having to cant your wrist very much uh, to get it right where you need it to be. Uh, big, big, big clip. Uh, I've always kind of thought the clip should be a little bit smaller uh, or at least not four screws. This is made by Lion Steel in Italy. And uh, it is one hell of a solid, beautiful, big folder. Uh, I wish, see, this can be done. This can be done. And maybe this is not the biggest seller for Bastinelli, though I know they're bringing it back. Um, uh, just this year, actually, they're bringing the, the big Drago Tack back in like M390. This is in uh, D, what is this? This D2? Can't remember. I think this is in, oh, this is in N690, I believe, since it's Italian. Uh, doesn't have the crown spine. Um, but yeah, you can. it can be done. Other makers do it. People will buy them. People will buy them, not necessarily carry them. This is actually a very good knife to carry. It carries very easily. Even though it's got a pretty big footprint, it's it's somewhat, well, it is pretty big, but it carries nice. Uh, other companies should be getting on this train. I know that uh, <laughs> this train left a long time ago. I guess maybe it's not that big a deal. Maybe I just make a big deal out of it because I love collecting these giant uh, folders. But I think... I think all the companies should make a large folder, something four inches or over, um, just because they would have people like me who are not buying their knives because they're three and a quarter inch going for their knives because there are a lot of beautif beautifully designed smaller knives that I don't get because that's a great excuse not to get a knife. It's not the size I like. <sighs> anyway, so yeah, this big drag attack, cool. And right here, this is one of those uh, things from Lion Steel. That's a little weird. This roto block, I think they call it the roto block. Uh, you, when it's open, you turn this that way, and now you can't unlock it. And I just don't understand the benefit of that. I do not get the benefit of why you would lock this frame lock. Maybe someone could tell me because frame lock. Like part and parcel of a frame lock's strength is the fact that you are holding it shut by, by the mere, you, you are engaging the lock by the mere act of holding the damn knife. So this roto block thing, I don't really get. And it's okay on this one because it's pretty stiff and I think you can tighten it down. Yeah, you can tight, tighten it down. But um, I had one other, I can't remember what it was that had this feature on it and it engaged accidentally or, or um, you know, unintentionally 
frequently. And it was just a bummer to have it there. So if anyone knows why that really has to be there, let me know. Or is it just a cool thing that they decided to do that didn't end up being that cool? Okay, next up in the oldies but goodies, other large folders, I'm saying other because it's not cold steel, is the, oh yeah, here it is, the Boker Kalishnikov large Bowie. Oh yeah. So the uh, Boker Kalishnikov is probably their money makingest line of knives. I mean, they've come out with 8 million versions of this knife. It's four and three three quarters inches that blade. So they've come out with a million different versions of this knife. Uh, this is an exclusive to whom, uh, to what company I cannot remember. It's D2 steel. It's got that, it, it's got that um, satin sort of uh, um, stone wash. It's, it's a beautiful knife. The action is not spectacular. I think with large switch blades like this, large automatic knives, you know how the how how a large blade on a on a regular folder will aid in the in the deployment and the and the closing just by dint of the fact that it's a heavy blade. This uh, in an automatic scenario, I believe that big heavy blade is a hindrance, and it, this is not the snappiest. This this slaps open. It does not snap or 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 kick open. It slaps open. It's like, whoosh, whoosh. Uh, but it's still cool. I mean, you know, look at it. Uh, okay, so this was a gift uh, to me by Lavender Pants 86. Um, haven't heard from him in a while, but he's an awesome guy who uh, is a knife collector. And actually, he's he's the gentleman who hooked me up with my uh, with my Demco knife. He uh, uh, so thank you, sir. Uh, your XL here made it on my list. There, look at these. Look at these two things. So this makes me feel like I should have kept or should go out and buy, go out, you know, go out to the internet and buy uh, one of the large Kershaw, what the hell were they calling them? Strata folders. Uh, the small one was four and a half inches and the large one was five and a half inches. Those Bowies. I did a, uh, a giveaway, Gentleman Junkie giveaway with that knife. And it was very nice. It, it is the kind of five and a half inch folder you carry when you're wearing a tux or or a suit with light pants, you know? So you just, just to, you know, get that in the collection, just to sort of change things up and have more than just cold steel. So the Boker and the Bastinelli are my, <coughs> are my, my first forays into that. Oh, wait, let me just, before I move on from the Boker, I just have to show off the jimping on this. It's it's the wide variety. It's the big variety that I like, and it's perfect. It really does grip your hand, but it is not. I mean, you could do this. You could rub your thumb on it all day long, and it's not gonna it's not gonna hurt. But it still gives you good purchase. And then same here, though. It's kind of funny that they have it here, um, because this is clearly for reverse grip. And I love no one no one does this enough. There is no company putting jimping on the pommel enough for me. Uh, I like that they put it there, but it's kind of funny to see a reverse grip, a knife in reverse grip that's this big. Okay, that ends the state of the collection. <laughs> Oldies, but goodies. And it leads right into our conversation of the best USA made knife companies. And I am precluding in this all customs because yes, you are all awesome. Well, presumably all awesome, including this Stroop knife and uh, other knives I have in my collection that are handmade by Americans um, making their living, hacking it out with knives. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about big companies or biggish companies making big famous knives right here in the States. Now, <clears throat> when I was coming up with this and looking through my, uh, my knife chest, considering this, I looked at my Vero engineering knife um, you know, I looked at, uh, I looked at my Finch knives. I looked at plenty of knives that I love that are made, that are designed by Americans that are, um, you know, dreamt up and, and, and figured out and then made in China or elsewhere, uh, Italy. And, uh, I didn't want to include them just because there are, are a lot of them and I do like their work a lot and I love their design and that's not what this is about. Okay. You get the idea. All right, I'm going to take a little sip of coffee and gird my loins for this conversation. Okay, <clears throat> first up, Rick Hinderer knives. 
who does not love Rick Hinderer knives? And the example I'll show here um, is is really kind of the pinnacle of uh, of my uh, Hinderer knife collection, and I'll tell you why. And also represents uh, their growth. This is the uh, XM eighteen three and a half inch. This is a Warncliffe, and it's the DL. It is a DLT exclusive with no choil. Love this knife. It is, you know, it is sublime. And I will be saying that as we go along. It is just, it's, it is amazing. Um, but what about this and what about Rick Hinderer knives is so good? Well, <clears throat> the knife itself is very stout, very sturdy, sturdier than any of us need, probably 90% of us, uh, if we're being honest. But who doesn't like knowing that a product they're buying is, you know, able to able to stand up to all sorts of abuse. We all love it, especially in our tools. So we know that this thing is going to stand up. We can feel it. It's got this uh, very, very stout construction with, with very uh, wide and broad standoffs. You could run this thing over with a truck. It's not going to collapse. Um, it's got a full slab of titanium on the lock side and a thinner slab of titanium on uh, as a liner. On the show side, amazing milling in the handle. I love the texture of of XMs, and uh, from now on, I, I've sort of determined that when I get a an aftermarket handle scale for a hinderer, it's always going to have this milling because I miss it when it's not there. And I have a number of uh, aftermarket scales on other hinderers that are smooth, and mm, they just don't quite do it like this. But why does this? Uh, why else? Okay, the hinderer lock bar stabilizer slash uh over travel he's responsible for um in in this case it's right under the clip here but he's responsible for designing and coming up with that and it is ubiquitous now uh yeah across the across the uh, uh across the industry everyone's putting on lock bar stabilizers and uh and of one way or another or or over travel uh hindrances uh, on their knives. And sometimes they're not, uh, frequently they're built into the lock bar insert there. So he innovated that. And, uh, I mean, so many other things kind of came from him. The, the filler tab. I don't, I don't ever remember seeing a filler tab before hinderer, but the biggest thing about this knife, the reason I'm showing this hinderer in particular is that it's a triway pivot. So after years of, this is what I like about them after years with a proven recipe, they know people are going to buy their knives, no matter no matter how many, no matter how many XM18s they could possibly make in their Shreve, Ohio factory. That's another good thing. They're from Ohio. Uh, no matter how many they make, people would buy them. And then on the secondary, they'd go for even more. So they had a proven recipe, didn't need to do it, but they decided that they were going to innovate and allow people options with this triway pivot. So now all the hinderers, I think all of the hinderers, ship with the triway pivot. You receive it, it's got the, the bearing pivot, which is super smooth and fidgety, and uh, and a detune uh, and a detent tuned to that, uh, but also good for thumb studs, which is, I mean, they 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 really did it on this. Uh, they nailed the detent. They nailed the triway they nailed the uh, the use of bearings and if you don't like that you can switch out phosphor bronze or you can go for their uh nylatron washers so rick hinderer knives that's all i got to say great usa made knife company and uh their knives are made in ohio and i love that and i hope they never ever move away from ohio all right i'm going to put this over here xm18 three and a half inch worn cliff no choil dlt exclusive there you go. Next up, started as not a knife company. And there are two of those in this list here, actually. This company started as a gun grip company. Yes, you know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Hogue. Hogue Knives. So Hogue originally uh, was, uh, I mean, started off about 55 years ago, I think, as a company making um, ancillary parts for guns, uh, gun grips, uh, four, four stocks, different kind of stuff like that. And then 12 ish years ago, uh, they got into knife making and they enlisted Alan Alishowitz, one of the, one of the legends of tactical folding knives to design a, a suite of knives. He designed a whole bunch of them still does. 
and they are just amazing. And they took up the mantle when the uh, when the access lock patent ran out, ran off, uh, or ran out. They started putting access style locks on their knives called the Able Lock, ambidextrous bar lock enhanced Able Lock, and in many opinions, including yours truly, they they do it better than anyone, including Benchmade. I, I mean, Benchmade is good, too, of course. Uh, but everyone is coming out with their own version of this bar lock. And in my opinion, from what I have experienced, Hogue is the smoothest, the smoothest and nicest. And apparently they use the best springs, too. But that I don't really know about. I have never fidgeted with an Axis style lock enough to, to break the Omega spring. Uh, this is the Doug Ritter Hogue. Uh, this is the RSK the mini RSK Mark one with this beautiful purple G, uh, G mascus handle scales, almost called it G card, a G mascus handle scales with incredible milling. So now a gun grip company is going to know how to mill surfaces and gription and texture and all that kind of stuff. And what they do on these knives with this radiating sunburst pattern is amazing. It looks beautiful, but it really feels great in the hand and really does give you excellent grip 20 cv steel uh that is for this this doug Ritter, you know so doug ritter used to have spider or uh, used to have benchmade make his ritter griptilian or his uh rsk and now he has hogue do it and every hogue knife i've picked up and i have a few more in my case they're just outstanding quality products for people who really are going to use them like i these are excellent excellent User knives. Um, the only thing I don't like about the Hogue knives so far has been their clips. Uh, it's fine. It works. It's it, it's just a little too springy to me. It feels almost like it could bend easily. But you know what? I haven't bent it yet. And I'm just going to give them the benefit of the doubt that they have that part dialed in. Because everything else is so damn great on this knife and the other hogs I've had. So I'm so excited that they're making knives. Thank you for making knives and, and doing this, uh, you know, making these cool products and bringing the work of designers that would be otherwise out of reach to us at such high quality, American made high quality. I'm gonna put this down right here and move on. Next up, Emerson Knives. Yes, Emerson Knives. I hear some of you saying, yes, of course. And I hear a few of you moaning because Emerson knives tend to be polarizing. And I think the main reason that they're polarizing is that they have always and never veered and have always, always used a chisel ground edge. So here on this knife, this is the tiger. Uh, I love this knife. This is a, uh, a, uh, on the built on the CQC 13 handle and it's an excellent upswept clip point that reminds me a bit of the CQC eight just sort of fattened out a little bit uh, with a, with a nicely, nicely scooped out large wave that you can't miss. Uh, but by the way, there are ways to pull these out of your pockets without waving them simply by doing this. Uh, but anyway, I was talking about why they're so polarizing. Now, this knife here is V ground in that the um, the primary bevel is ground in on both sides. But the edge itself is a chisel edge. So sharpened on this side or uh, yeah, the edge is ground into this side, but not into this side, just ever so slightly on that side. Um, and that is something he, uh, Ernest Emerson has always stuck with. And it is something that has, uh, you know, has a lot of people upset <laughs> and always has because people don't like that. I, I do. It's very, very sharp. Having a chisel edge is very, very sharp. Uh, just like a chisel tool is a very sharp tool. The, the, the issue I have with the Emerson chisel edge is that he has always, and admittedly, I asked him this and he, he said straight up, uh, he has always put the chisel on the left-hand side. In, in, in other words, uh, the whole setup with his chisels, uh, even when it's a chisel ground blade and one side, entire side of the blade is flat, he puts it so that it's on, so that the grind is on the show side, not the clip side. 
And with the grind being on the show side, it looks like a beautiful knife. See, we see that grind and those grinds are always gorgeous and this, all this and, and the handle and no clip and you flip it over and then it's all flat here. And <laughs> that's fine for looks, but most of us are right-handed. Most of us are right-handed. So we want that flat chisel side on the left, on the left side, so that when we are cutting something, we can get as close and as accurate with the angle of that cutting edge to what we're cutting. In this case, if I were to try to shave something off, I would have to compensate for the angle ground in here blindly. Whereas if that chisel edge were on this side, I could just use the flat of the blade or the flat of the um, bevel here as my guide, as a tactile guide. So, I mean, I love Emerson's and uh, you're never going to convince me that a chisel edge isn't awesome, uh, but I get why some people don't like them. Also, when you get an Emerson, you deal with an adolescent phase that is um, trying, to say the least. Uh, all of my Emersons are smooth and amazing, but they all went through, except for ones that I've gotten secondhand, they all went through an adolescent period where there was nasty lockstick. And and I just thought, oh my gosh, how did this turn out like this? Like, is this a lemon? You know, probably things we think about our kids. Uh, you know, is is this child a lemon? Will they ever learn to make their bet? You know, whatever it is, <laughs> you know. And then suddenly they blossom into these amazing in this case, knives or children, uh, they turn in, you know, they blossom into these amazing creations. And, and you're like, well, it was all me. It was all me. I did it just right. I broke that knife in just right. And now it's very smooth. So I feel accomplished. Uh, and, you know, maybe that's how it is with kids, too. I don't know. My kids aren't old enough for me to say. Uh, so Emerson Knives made out in California right here. It is still a smallish operation. Um, they are not making all of their models all of the time. And so each knife gets special attention and, um, you know, like them, love them or hate them uh, or love them or don't like them. I think people respect and like Ernest Emerson and they respect and like the designs from afar. But a lot of people, when they get them, especially, uh, you know, knife sticklers, they're like, mm, this should be perfect out of the box. And there is an argument for that. Okay, next up is Zero Tolerance Knives. Zero Tolerance, where have you gone, Zero Tolerance? You used to be beautiful, man. Hey, what, what movie is that from? And you can't look it up. Uh, okay, so here it is, uh, my favorite Zero Tolerance. Though, actually, I don't know if I can say that. I have five left in my Zero Tolerance sub-collection, and they're all awesome. The other three... Uh, or the three of them are Ernest Emerson designs. And then the fourth one is the zero 200 that my brother gave me the, probably the first uh, zero tolerance I ever saw. And I was like, Oh my God, that thing's amazing. So, but this thing is also amazing. And this is a Sinkovich design. Dmitry Sinkovich from Belarus just designs incredible knives that I would never otherwise be able to get my hands on. And, uh, so Zero Tolerance brought this and other Sinkovich designs, as well as other major designers and makers designs to the public, to the buying market at at relatively affordable prices. Uh, you know, I, I'd rather pay 250 bucks for a ZT Sinkovich than not be able to pay 2000 bucks for a real Sinkovich or whatever it costs. Um, so, but Zero Tolerance, uh, a Kai company, uh, the up brand of Kershaw, the the Lexus to Kershaw, if you will, and uh, just incredibly made here in the States. They came out with, I mean, it's it's endemic in the name, zero tolerance. What are they saying? Well, it sounds a little arg. So, you know, I have zero tolerance for your nonsense and I have a knife or like they're, the tolerances are so tight uh, that that these are incredibly made knives. I think both. I think it's. Uh, you know, both play into why they call it zero tolerance. Um, but they really made their name on making tough, beefy knives. And then, and then, and some of it had to do with the, a couple of the, like one of the Sinkovich designs and some other designs, they got a little light, they got a little light and well, I'm not gonna say that, but they got a little light and seemingly less robust. Now I never experienced a lack of robusticity 
in any ZT knife, but I did get rid of the Sinkovich Design 0460. It was cool, beautiful, well-made, but it felt too light. I know that's funny because we're always talking about weight reduction and all that, but this, this knife just felt too light to me. I don't know what it was. Uh, so I ended up getting rid of it or, you know, selling it to get something else. Uh, and now they're back with, they've had a couple of uh, knives that have gone back towards their roots in the last year, the uh, last two years. Like the 308 is what I'm thinking of primarily. That 308 is a beautiful knife and I had a chance to uh, check it out. I, I've never owned one and uh, haven't had one on loan here, but in at Blade Show, I had a chance to to fiddle around with one and what a great knife i would love to get it in into this collection uh if i found it for the right price on the secondary market i would jump on it but i'm not in a zt kick right now but the fact that this company is able to make these kind of knives says two things a get back on it and start making some more of them and come out with a with a, a little bit broader. I mean, you come out with six billion Kershaws a year. Can you maybe reduce it by a couple thousand and then add a few to your ZT lineup? I don't mean to be a smart ass, but you know what I'm saying. And uh, and then also, you should be OEMing for other people. If you can make knives of this quality and yet you're not kind of doing much of it, why are you not offering your services as an OEM for some of these amazingly talented American designers and American companies. You know, uh, uh, um, Microtech just had Reich Knife build their, um, had uh, Reich Knife build their uh, SOCOM Bravo beautifully. I can't wait to get my hands on that. But, you know, I guess I just answered my own question. You're not going to have Microtech farm out their work to ZT, but what about if, uh, you know, what what about if Vero Engineering could afford to make a knife through zero tolerance as an OEM? That would be amazing or damn designs or something like that. So zero tolerance, I'm telling you to take a look at the books, get your accountants together and figure out how to make it happen. Thank you. All right. Next up is the Chris Reeve Knives Company. Chris Reeve Knives. This is the Sabenza. Um, I also have... I also have the Umnums on close by. I just, it's taken me a while, but I have grown to absolutely love this knife company. Love them without having to get everything they make. Love doesn't necessarily mean all consuming. Um, but I like classical music and maybe Indian food or, or, or whatever it is uh, in your life. It's an acquired taste. It's something that requires a little bit of maturity <laughs> to to like and maybe you're saying it doesn't didn't take me any maturity bob what's your problem and i think my problem was always uh chris reeve knives are really great and you know they're reliable but they're just they just don't get my heart beating uh like an emerson does or something with uh with a lot of uh swoops and curves and jaggedy spots and i don't know it was just too refined for me for a while uh, even though I had mad respect. Well, now that mad respect has turned to mad love. Um, this, this Sabenza, I could never, this is S35VN. This is from, this was made on Leap Day 2016. So it only has a birthday every four years. February 29th, 2016. I think that's kind of cool. I also think it's cool that they give you a birth card. But this one I dropped on its tip and I could never get very sharp. I don't know why. Uh, so I sent it to Jared Neve. He took care of both issues, gave me a mirror mirror polish, and it is it is a perfect knife now. And with this deep hollow grind and this endless um, sharpening choil, you could, I'm not going to because, you know, that's just not my lifestyle, but you could use this knife and sharpen it until it was about two-thirds as thin as it is right now, and it would still be a, an amazing knife. Uh, I like I like that Chris Reeve um, himself. I like the story. Uh, former, you know, motorcycle racer turned knife maker from South Africa moves here. American Dream stuff. Uh, his son has taken over the business. Tim Reeve, a, a great guy, and uh, you know the products are just getting better and better. You know, so Chris Reeve knives has also set a very high bar uh, for American knife makers. 
and American knife companies. And thankfully, I, I believe that years and years of them putting out this superior product and years and years of people using it as a comparison knife in thousands and thousands of videos, I, I believe that that has added to it too. I mean, it's like, uh, it's like the high end PM two, you know, everyone uses it as a comparison knife. Well, there is a reason the tolerances are amazing. The, uh, action is amazing. This hydraulic action. I, th I believe that term hydraulic for, um, washer, uh, folder action was invented from them. Not, not like they said it, but People in talking about the action on a Chris Reeve knife came up with hydraulic and it's perfect. And I love it. I love everything about them. And, uh, oh, not for nothing. I think their, uh, I think their Tanto design is also super cool <laughs> with the little wedge like front and then the rest of it hollow ground. Just gorgeous. All right. Chris Reeve knives. Thank you guys. All right. Next up is Microtech. I was just talking about Microtech uh, because they did something um, <laughs> which might disqualify them from this list. Actually, no, it doesn't. They make all of their knives in America, except now they're having a blinged up version of the Socom Bravo, a knife that you can usually only find uh, as a custom from uh, Marfioni knives um, from, with Reich Knife. Reich Knife in China, who whose own knives are always just, uh, you know, um, flex. They, 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 they just show off how, how talented they are at machining things. And they come up with some pretty hideous knives, but beautifully made and sculpted. You know, these, I, I say they're hideous. They're not my taste. Uh, these sort of biomorphic knives, gorgeously sculpted. They are capable of doing anything, it seems, with a mill or an EDM. And so now they're doing Microtex, uh, uh, Socom Bravo. So I guess Microtech wanted to come up with a way to mass produce the Bravo. Uh, I, I don't know why they're doing it. See, this is this is the thing. I just don't know exactly why they're doing it. I guess just to up their numbers and to sell more knives. But anyway, that that is a discussion for a different time. And I am going to get that knife, and then I'm going to talk about it because I'm going to love it. Uh, and I, you know, yeah, do what you want, Microtech. But they have always prided themselves on being an American made knife. And why is that? Well, because what they make is outstanding. They, uh, since the early mid nineties <clears throat> have been making automatics and really eccentrically designed automatics. Um, like I'm thinking back to the Kestrel and some of their earlier designs, just incredibly done like machined beautifully and the action of these are incredible they are not g and g hawk um knives they are they are a little bit more every day uh, the g and g hawk deadbolt or deadlock is their their knife uh, that has no play and this has play like most automatic knives but they are awesome so i do not have an out the side Microtech. I would love to get the UT, uh, the 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 U, the underwater demolition knife. I think that would be cool. Uh, next up is uh, Mike uh, is Protech, another automatic knife company, uh, making primarily automatic knives, but they have really knocked it out of the park uh, lately with their um, with their button lock flippers, like the Malibu. Um, this is a great this example. This is the this is the uh, what do they call this TR three is probably my favorite of their designs. They also do a lot of great work with uh, accomplished designers putting out their work in automatic, like Strider. Um, great kick to these knives, really excellent action. And uh, funny enough, I had never heard until yesterday of a Protec spring or any coil spring breaking, uh, but the gent I sold my, um, my Strider SNG to he had a lock spring. Uh, he had a spring break and had to send it back. He said for a couple of days he had, this was Nick Martino. He had a couple of, uh, a couple of days with it being a, a regular button lock knife. So pretty cool. All right. So that's the pro tech company, knife company out of California, making amazing high quality knives. Also making amazing high quality knives is three rivers manufacturing out of Massachusetts. 
They started as a company that uh, milled out handle scales for uh, out of G10 for all the major knife companies and and parts, titanium parts for uh, custom knife builders. And then one day they said, we could make the whole kit and caboodle right here. Uh, so they, uh, because, uh, uh, um, well, they had all the machines and they had the milling expertise. Uh, so this is a special TRM, Adam. This one is black coated, DLC coated. And the interesting thing about this DLC that they, how they coat their, their knives, they almost in most light look like they're not coated. <laughs> like most of the time I move it around, I'm like, it doesn't look coated in the, in the camera, but it's black coated. And it's a factory second. You can tell by those two dots next to the USA. Let's see if that'll focus. And it's got G Carta scales from GL Hansen and Sons. Um, so this this example is my favorite, <laughs> but just the company itself is so great, and their product is so excellent. And not for nothing, it's reasonably priced at least when when they drop them when you get them on the secondary market i guess the price goes up a bit but these are under 200 bucks and they're handmade here you know on mills and you know right here in in massachusetts and they are incredibly high quality the grinds are real thin the blades are thin the grinds are excellent and perfect symmetrical the action is smooth and wonderful on washers uh there's they're stout as hell even though it's slim and slender I, I feel it, it's somewhat indestructible. These things are awesome. So Three Rivers Manufacturing, um, they do a little bit of OEM work for some of the for for a couple of big biggies, and uh, that's what other companies should be doing. So thank you TRM for being awesome. All right, next up, this is one of the companies I was talking about earlier. This is Tactile Knife Company. Tactile Knife Company started as Tactile Turn, as I mentioned earlier, the pen company. They took a turn into knife making and just man alive in less than two years have created a superior american made knife and by superior i don't mean it's better than all of these i just mean it is top top quality top tier and also you know this is a three inch knife and i believe it's it's in the 250 range reasonably priced that is a reasonable price for a for this knife and how much work engineering and handwork and machine work went into this uh and in less than two years they have now what three models they have this no four models they have the rock wall and then they have the rock wall thumb stud version and then they have the bear the the slip joint we we're talking about and then they have an eight inch chef's knife and they're all reasonably priced for the quality you're getting so it can be done. Let, let's get some OEM happening here. Let's get some of these amazing, talented American designers who can't afford to build their knives in the States have an option. Uh, next is a knife, one-man knife company made at home. Uh, and I'm talking about American Blade Works. This thing, the, okay, so this is the American Blade Works uh, Model 1 Version 5. He stopped at version six, and that's and that's what he sells now. Um, so very interesting the way um, they went about this at American Blade Works. Uh, made a, uh, a bunch of prototypes, sent them out, got feedback. From the feedback, made changes, sent out a version two, sent out a version three. Uh, not just sent them out, but people bought them, and and they were he was taking feedback actively and incorporating that feedback in each new iteration. And, and this is the version five, and I'm not exactly sure. Oh, I, I do, I did, I did experience a six and he, he did make some refinements, but you would never know from this example that it needed refining. And then you pick up the six and you're like, oh, wow. And, but I don't remember what it was <laughs> because I can't imagine what this needs. This took a while to break in. This is on bearings, and I believe that blasted texture on the blade um, was slowing down the action a little bit. And um, I don't know. I didn't take it. I didn't never taken this knife apart, but I, I think that's what happened. 
And then as I flipped it more and more, it wore in a groove. And then I recently put some, uh, some uh, knife pivot lube in there, and now it's just flying. Um, just a great knife. Great, 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 great knife. Uh, full flat ground, thin. But why is it a great knife company? Because it's one guy and his family making a go of it and making a, an excellent, excellent product that people love and respect. And he listens to his, his uh, customers and he incorporates those changes. He gives the people what they want. And it's for a reasonable, pr reasonable price all right here in the United States. I'm starting to feel more and more as I'm talking that this should be more and more doable. Uh, like this company, this next one, Millet Knives out of Utah. They uh, Millet Knives is another family company. All of these are fam pretty much all of these are family companies, which I love. Uh, but Millet Knives came from uh, um, Josiah DeMille and his father both worked at Chris Reeve Knives and, and worked there for a long time and and got their milling chops uh, really, really well honed there. And, oh, honed. Uh, and then they left and started this company, Millet Knives, as an OEM and, and a maker of their own knives. So this, is, this example here is the Perpetua, designed by uh, TJ Schwartz, who just designed some of the greatest knives ever, like the Koenig Arius and, uh, uh, and the Overland and just some great, great, awesome knives. Uh, this is one of my favorites of his designs, and it's a, a uh, this was a mass drop distributed and, and uh, well, this was a mass drop knife, meaning they uh, mass the company drop, which used to be mass drop, uh, commissioned this knife. And uh, now Millet Knives is making it as their own knife. The, the drop contract is over. And now they're going to be making this uh, under their own shingle. And uh, I'm psyched about that because this is an awesome, this is a, a way superior Benchmade uh, Griptilian, if you ask me. Uh, superior in pretty much every way. Uh, but it reminds me of that knife. You know, so that's why I make the comparison. And, and it's not just because of the ambidextrous barlock thing here. Uh, great knife, great company. Look for more coming from them. By the way, this... Uh, this hollow grind is done on one of their mills, and it is so thin. It's such a nice hollow grind. This was a gift from viewer, uh, viewer and uh, patron, Mr. Filato. Thank you, Mr. Filato. Such an awesome gift. He heard me talking about how I liked liked that knife so much that he gave it to me. I was bumming. I was like, I missed it. I always miss things. I mean, and <laughs> whining and complaining. He's like, just shut up. Here, take this one. <laughs> so thank you, man. I appreciate it greatly. All right, penultimate U.S. knife company that is just awesome and that I love is uh, Spartan Blades. Love Spartan Blades. I only have two Spartan Blades, and they're both designed by the great and powerful Bill Harsey. So I have the Spartan Harsey folder here, and then I have the Spartan Harsey dagger over in the case. Um, okay, started by two Special Forces vets, you know, two Green Berets, I think they are. Uh, former Green Berets, Curtis Iovito, and um, oh dear Lord, I, I'm sorry, I forget the other gentleman's name. He he wasn't on the show, so I, I I his name didn't get cemented. I apologize. It's on the tip of my tongue. But anyway, uh, you know they they retire from the the armed forces. I believe they were snipers or long range shooters or something like that, and uh, start this company on tactile on on tactical fixed blade knives. I apologize for all the stuttering. They started making tactical fixed blade knives in North Carolina near, I guess, near Fort Bragg. And um, they all had these beautifully shaped, uniquely shaped tactical blades. And then they, they ended up going into folders. Their first couple folders I wasn't crazy about. And then when this popped, I was like, oh, oh, oh my, yes. And um, now they do uh, a 3.25 inch version of this and then they also do a um couple of uh more budget friendly knives they do uh, a folding version of the 3.25 inch one of this in g10 and i can't remember what the steel uh and then they also do a less george collaboration uh folder in that same sort of budget line now budget there i think they're like 150 bucks so uh, budget is a relative term but um, the thing I love about the Spartan Harsey folder and why I think that this 
is a flagship for them or maybe the flagship for them is the build is just insane it's it's got those wide standoffs those wide stout standoffs and slabs of titanium like a hinderer um it's got the feel of a chris reeve knife it's got that that hydraulic slow not slow it's not what i mean um well it feels like glass on glass with oil in between when you move when you open it and shut it and it fits great in hand it's stout as hell the one complaint I would have about this. I'm not crazy about how they terminate the edge here. I think a I think a Chris Reeve knife termination like this, like if you just cut it away like that, would be way better. And while we're at it, I wouldn't mind a hollow grind on this knife either, or at least a little bit thinner. Uh, but you know, this is built for robusticity, as I am coining. And well, you know, I guess they don't want to do that. This one is graced with the Knife Junkie logo here and on the filler tab. Uh, compliments of Spartan Blades. Thank you very much, guys. All right, last knife in the uh, last knife company in the American made knives knife company category is Demco Knives. Andrew Demco, I probably have more knives designed by Andrew Demco than anyone else because I have a whole bunch of cold steels, but I love him and his brother and, his, and their company. And uh, to say love, well, I'm, I guess I'm getting gushy, but they are great guys. When, when you meet them, you just want to see them succeed. And when you hold their knives, you understand why they have, why, why Demko Knives is a success. Uh, Andrew Demko has innovated um, lock design several times. Uh, this, the Scorpion lock, so this is the shark lock. There's the scorpion lock. There's the triad lock, uh, which is the um, platform for most cold steel folders. And and then he did the uh, a sort of plunge lock thing that that ended up uh, that was on the Bushman pocket Bushman. And I think he's designed another. I think there's another lock. But the point is, he's innovated and changed knife locks several times. It's like Miles Davis changing jazz several times just by force of will. And uh, these guys uh, build these knives incredibly stout. It's not just a cool design and a great lock that is, by the way, incredibly fun to play with. But they have put it all on a platform that is incredibly robust and stout. Look at the standoffs. Again, we're looking at wide, wide standoffs. Three of them here. You, this is another one of those knives you could probably run over with a car though it does not have liners uh th but the the uh the g10 is so damn thick i don't think it would need liners i think you could still probably do a hell of a lot of damage to this thing and have it have it come right back for more uh demco knives in pennsylvania they're uh, made in wampum pennsylvania as they let as they let you know right here on their on the clip side of their pivot and so innovative family company and um, making incredibly um, stout, sturdy, high quality work. And that's basically what we're seeing across this whole spectrum here, because they're not going to survive. No American knife company is going to survive charging American knife prices if they're not making an outstanding superior product. And I believe I, I guess this, the term superior uh, is misleading. Um, I, I just mean top of the heap, all of these. Um, I, I think I'm going to stop talking because I think you know what I mean. <laughs> I think I'm just going on and on at this point. Uh, but let me run down my top USA made knife companies. Rick Hinderer Knives, Hogue Knives, Emerson Knives, Zero Tolerance, Chris Reeve Knives, Microtech, Protech, Three Rivers Manufacturing, Tactile Knife Company, American Blade Works, Millet, Spartan Blades, and Demco Knives. They're all beautiful and really well-made knives, really well-designed, and then there are great people behind the products. That's another thing I love. Our countrymen, well, some of ours. I know there are people who are living elsewhere, but you know, Americans like you and me behind each one of these knives, and I love that. 
All right. So, well, thank you for uh, stopping by. Thanks for dropping in and listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the notification bell if you're taking this all in on YouTube. If not, if you're listening, uh, well, hit subscribe there because it will come to you every week. You can uh, do that on Apple, Google, iHeart, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and a whole scad of others. And uh, you just listen to the golden tones of Bob DeMarco. Uh, check us out on uh, next Sunday for an interview show of highest quality, of course. And, uh, you know, we get a lot of great guests on this show. I'm, I'm grateful that p- these people come on and want to talk to me. And then uh, check us out Thursday night, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for our live stream Thursday Night Knives. So for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, please don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.